And you know what, I, I thought I was being smart by closing the door and not allowing my dog to come into this room. I found out she's actually here hiding. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to get up for a second and let her out. Good evening, welcome to the meeting of Independent School District 271. Today is Monday, April 27, 2020, it is 7 p.m. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the executive orders issued by Governor Tim Walz, the school board meeting will not be conducted in the Arlene Bush Room at the Educational Services Center. The meeting will be conducted via Google Hangouts Meet and live stream on BEC TV. We are moving into roll call. So at this time, I'm gonna call every school, every school board member. Please um, respond by saying here or present. Director Beth Bibi. Here. Director Tom Bennett. Here. Director Maya Olson. Here. Director Jim Sorum. Here. Director Heather Starks. Here. Director Don Steigat. Here. And Nelly Corman is present. 
Next, we have approval of agenda. Would somebody like to move approval of the agenda, please? So moved. Second. Stag off. Thank you. All those in favor of approving the agenda, please say aye. I will do the roll call again. Director Bibi? Aye. Director Bennett? Aye. Director Olson? Aye. Director Sorum? Aye. Director Starks? Aye. Director Steigaff? Aye. And aye. The agenda has been approved. Uh, next, we move into recognitions and we have a student school board representative reports and I believe that Ms. Shante Brown would like to go first. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, obviously, with what's going on right now, there's uh, not really a lot to report specifically. Uh, thankfully, administration at Jefferson has been has kept a lot of touch and with the seniors representatives at the Student Council, so we've been talking about a lot of that, that answering a lot of questions and polling a lot of our students and peers and families to see what they need, what questions they may have. And we're trying to do our best to keep morale up amongst the student body so we can all get through this together. Um, fortunately, I think we've been doing pretty good. I know a lot of them are excited to hear from this meeting, but yeah, we've, we've been doing good. I've been doing good. I think student council has been doing a great job doing what they can to try to keep everybody's, keep everybody happy. So that's, that's what I've got. Okay. Thank you. Next we go with Ms. Ali Starks. Ali, we cannot hear you. Or I can. I don't know if anybody else can. Shoot, what the heck? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now, now we can hear you. Okay. So um, we've been doing kind of the same thing, keeping in touch with um, administration. I know that um, Mr. Hostetler has been doing some Instagram live stuff. Where, um, we can ask him questions, he answers in real time. Um, same with uh, Kennedy, uh, with the whole, making sure that we're keeping morale up and stuff. I know that student government had a virtual spirit week. So we had like pajama day, um, crazy sock day, college day, blue and gold day. And we sent our pictures to um, the Kennedy student government Instagram page and they would post them there. So that was a cool way to stay connected with all of us. And um, I know me and Shantae talked about um, BSAC. So the Board Student Advisory Council, we've been um, keeping in touch a lot, like a lot. We have a group chat on GroupMe and we have been active on it pretty much every day. Um, it's been super fun. We um, make sure we always check in with each other and um, we have, on in the process of our replacements because me and Shante will be graduating soon. Um, we have some nominations and me and Shante have been looking over them and we've decided to keep them just from BSAC so they know like the go around with BSAC and how it works. Um, and once we kind of whittle down, then we will report our choices. Uh, BSAC will discuss about it and we will give those um, nominees to admin for them to um, approve and then it goes to you guys next meeting so we're super excited about that we're super excited about the people that we have so far and yeah that's about it that concludes my report uh nelly you're muted Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just saying that I, I want to say thank you to both of you and, and really appreciate that you're with us here tonight during this meeting. I know you, you have one more meeting with us, um, but we appreciate you, you know, looking into um, the, the students that will be coming to be part of, of the school board student representatives and taking your places and you know, you are in our thoughts and all the other students who are graduating this year, we're definitely thinking about you. We're thinking about all students, but um, you are 
you are in our thoughts right now. So we appreciate what you're doing and, and, and we feel it for you and for what you have to go through. So thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we're going into approval of part A of the agenda. And part A is for business grants, contracts, agreements, and finances. Would someone move the approval of part A of the agenda, please? So moved. Teacher. Okay, and that was Director Bennett. Uh, somebody like to second? Second, Stegoff. Thank you. All those in favor of approving part A of the agenda, please say aye. And you can say aye at the same time, I think. Okay. Aye. 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 Any opposed? I don't hear anyone saying no, so that part A has been approved. Thank you. Uh, we're moving into part B of our agenda. Tonight we have the, once again, COVID-19 update, and it will be Superintendent Fujitaki who will be giving the introduction to this item. And uh, for all board members and, and for the uh, public, um, we're gonna listen to all the all the presenters tonight, and then we will leave the questions for the end. Okay, so Superintendent Fujitaki. Great, thank you, Chair Corbin. Tonight, our district team will share how our district is responding to Governor, Governor Walz's new executive order. Last week, the governor issued a new executive order with four major directives. The first directive keeps our schools closed and extends distance learning to the end of this school year. The second directive says that schools will continue to provide childcare and food distribution, a grab and go meal program. The third directive talks about what happens after the end of the school year. The Commission of Education is directed to, to give guidance for distance learning during the summer period. That guidance might include the possibility of a hybrid model of distance learning and in-school learning. And all this is because the governor's current stay-at-home order expires on May 3rd. So we're waiting to hear his new orders about stay-at-home to start planning for the summer program. The final directive talks about the next school year. The 2021 school year is dependent on the recommendation of the Commission of Health. Schools may be a combination of in-school and distance learning at that time. Our first leader to present on how our district is responding to the governor's executive order is Andy Kubis, who is our executive director of learning and teaching. He'll be addressing our distance learning plans for this school year. Board members, please hold your questions till the end of the presentation. Andy, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Superintendent Fujitaki. Madam Chair, school board members, viewing public, uh, Thank you for letting me uh, give an update on the distance learning plan. Uh, I want to first by thanking, uh, thank Ali and Shante for their updates. That was heartwarming to me just to hear that there is communication that's happening for the students and our administration. Uh, later, a little later on, I'm going to talk about feedback. And this is just one piece of feedback that we get to hear from students about how things are going. And I was, I'm, I'm heartwarmed to hear that things are going uh, as well as we could probably expect uh, although we'll continue to keep to keep getting better. So thank you students for, for what you were doing. As the superintendent talked about, <clears throat> pardon me, the government issued executive order 2041 on Thursday, which extended distance learning. Uh, quite honestly, that's what we were waiting for. We had anticipated that, but we were waiting for that and beginning to do some of our planning. I had a couple takeaways from the governor's press conference uh, that were important, I think, for us to acknowledge. The first thing is the governor talked about how difficult this is, how difficult distance learning is. And he used a personal example with his seventh grade daughter and just how difficult it is. And I would go as far to say that the governor probably uh, has a lot of things that he can put in place to help. Uh, and if he's finding it difficult, I can't imagine uh, everyone else and how difficult this must be. And so this is a very, very difficult time. And I thought it was, it was honorable for the governor to acknowledge that. The other thing that, I, that he acknowledged quite well, in fact, I would say he doubled down on is that we know as well as we're doing and as hard as we're trying, we there are still gaps and there are still people who are being uh, left behind. 
And we work every single day to try to figure out how to connect with those students. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But again, I thought that was important that the governor recognized that again, as well as we're doing, we still can do better. And there are students who are and families who need more help. And we work every single day to try to figure out how to reach those families. So I thought that was important. I also want to acknowledge that distance learning, I get the, uh, the honor of sitting up here and, and telling you about it, but it's not just about the assignments and the grading. Distance learning is about our special education uh, staff. It's about our learning support staff, our tech staff, our communication staff. There are so many people who come together to make a distance learning plan. And so uh, it's not just about you know, the, the assignments we send out, it's about all the things that happen around support and making sure that people have what they need for access. So uh, a shout out to all of my colleagues who, who do wonderful work and it's fun to be a partner with them. But distance learning is more than, than just the academic piece. Having said that, I would say that uh, generally speaking in Bloomington, distance learning is going very well. Uh, the way that the staff and our families have rallied together, uh, as well as the students obviously has been very, very impressive. You know, uh, it took a couple weeks, I'd say, for us to find our stride. Um, and then I think we got into a groove where we could, uh, most of the time, we figured out what that balance was between the amount of work to give out and what to expect back. There are still areas where that needs to be worked on to be sure, but generally speaking, uh, we're doing a really, really good job. You know, I, I, I chalk up that, that uh, initial start to, uh, I remember I hearken back to when I was a first year teacher, when you spent countless hours in the classroom because you just didn't know any better what needed to be done until you found your groove. And I think for us, it took us a couple of weeks, but we found a groove. And uh, so I'm impressed with, with all of that. One thing that I'd want to impress upon you with our, with our plan is that we are continuously uh, implementing continuous improvement. And what I mean by that is we are listening to our constituents every single day when it comes to our distance learning plan. We get feedback every day and we spend countless hours thinking about what else can we be doing better. There's been, there was no guidebook on this. Uh, the chair and I were in a conversation earlier a couple of weeks ago and she said, for you know, upcoming administrators, maybe a class should be what to do during a pandemic uh, because if there's just no way to know what's happening. And so we're doing the very best we can. And so what took us eight days, we got eight days to, to come up with a plan. Quite honestly, it, we could have used eight months. And so every day we learn and we tweak and we go forward. And so I'm proud, I'm proud of that. The feedback we get uh, comes in lots of different forms. Uh, we get uh, emails from, from families all the time. Um, the surveys that we've talked about, uh, so a survey was released this weekend. Uh, my understanding is that will close this week. Dr. Highstead and uh, the department, the REA department, will take that data and give it to us, uh, cleanse it and give it to us, and then we use that data to continuously improve what is happening with distance learning. But we also know that surveys are just one way to get feedback back, that there is a bunch of families who don't take surveys for lots of different reasons. It might be a language barrier. Uh, it might be that they're working and they don't have time to do it. And so we get, we get uh, information from lots of different people. One of the most important ways that we get information is through our teachers and through our administration. That when a student or a family has a relationship with the teacher, that they're opt to tell them what's happening, what they need. And then that information from every single teacher gets goes to their administrator or to their supervisor or to their special education coordinator. And then we get it at our distance learning problem solving team. And we make good decisions based on that data as well. And so we've got lots of points of data that we factor in. That distance learning problem solving team uh, is about 12 people. And we meet twice a week for an hour, hour and a half, and we talk about all the things that are percolating to the top around distance learning. And as you can imagine, the feedback we get is, is in three areas. There are some people who are saying, this isn't enough, we need more. There are people who say this is great or don't say anything. And then there's a, a group who says, this is too much, slow down, please. And it's our job at the district's distance learning problem solving team to take all of that feedback and as a group, make the best decision for kids and families and our teachers. And I think that's something that we need to acknowledge as well publicly is 
uh, you know, our teachers are outstanding and they do great work, but many, many times they're at home with their three kids trying to do distance learning as well. And, and I think sometimes, uh, you know, we, we forget about that because they're the teachers who are the rock, but they're also juggling. And so we always factor their best interest and in mental health into our conversations as well. That distance learning problem solving team comes together like I said, a couple of times a week, and we try to get better every single time and, and adjust accordingly. As an example, uh, the you know two examples that we talked about were you know workload we talked about for for students uh, and families, and we made some tweaks there, and then grading and assessments we had to make some decisions, and oftentimes we make those decisions with all of the feedback, uh, but without much guidance, and so we uh, we just do the best we can thinking about who our constituents are and the people that we serve. And so continuous improvement is, is a major part of, of what we do. So moving forward, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, the governor released, like we said, uh, executive order 2041. In that, I'd say he doubled down on a couple of things. He doubled down on the historically disadvantaged and called that out and talked about that's something that we need to continue to do. I think in Bloomington, we are doing a very good job of that. Uh, but again, we continue to get better. You know, we know <clears throat> the superintendent shared some attendance data with you. And if you look uh, at the attendance data, in some levels, the attendance has gone up. In the elementary school, if you compare last year at this time, at least until the end of the year to this year, our attendance has gone up 2%. At the middle school, it's pretty even or up 2% at one school, <clears throat> pardon me. And at Jefferson and Kennedy, it's about even, uh, plus one or minus one either way. That sounds great at, at the front end and at the top level, but if you dig into that, you'll see that there are still some families that we're leaving behind. And so we study that data to see who is it that we're leaving behind. And I'm really, really proud of our, of our school and our staff because what we're doing, we're looking at attendance data, and then we're digging into who are we leaving behind. And then every single school, including early childhood, is, has a mechanism to start digging into who is not engaged in school. So it's one thing to check in and be attended. It's another thing to be engaged and do your work and make sure that you're, that you're present. And so all 15 sites have a plan about how they do it. And their plan is different because each site has different resources. You think about an Indian Mounds, which is a smaller school compared to a Jefferson High School or a Kennedy. They have much more resources at the high school. So each of the schools have a plan about how they go in and make sure that if a student is not uh, showing up or engaged about how they do that, it's quite impressive the work that's being done to try to reach every family. Not to mention the work that our special education friends are doing with the kids that are in their caseloads, learning supports with our, with our uh, homeless and highly mobile population. The list goes on and on as we continue to find the students and make sure that we are keeping them engaged because we fear that if we lose them, we might not lose them to the end of the year, we might lose them, lose them. And that's something that uh, we wanna keep working on. So uh, really, really in impressed with the work that's being done. Last thing I'll share is uh, in the governor's executive order, he talked about uh, May 1st and May 4th are when for school districts to take that time and plan uh, for the next uh, leg, if you will, of distance learning until the end of the school year. And uh, we are just about finished with that planning. We'll release that planning uh, to teachers uh, probably tomorrow. Um, but we want to make sure that we are doing our part at the district level to do the planning, taking all the feedback that I mentioned uh, and making sure we're doing the right things and then letting teachers take the time to figure out what is it that they need to do to finish the race? What standards do, as they distill their standards to figure out what needs to get accomplished? How do they do that? And then lastly, what sometimes gets unspoken is, how do they wrap up a school year? And so there's one way to do it in a classroom, and we all have our ways as educators to wrap that up. It's very, very different uh, in this setting. And so uh, helping some teachers out, helping teachers out with how might you bring closure to your students in this type of setting. That's very, very important that students see and feel the closure and understand that that's happening and that the adult in the room, if you will, is providing that. So in a nutshell, really impressed with what we're doing. We know that we can always do better and that's how we spend the bulk of our day is figuring out what we can do better. And so I'm impressed with our, with our work, impressed with our teachers, our students and our family and impressed with our team here. That concludes my report. I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer McIntyre. 
Thank you, Andy Kubis. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Superintendent Fujitaki, and directors of the school board. Um, it is um, an honor for me tonight to be able to present on the information and also to follow um, Executive Director Kubis's uh, presentation on direct, uh, distance learning. We have been working very closely together as we've been rolling out and putting together our plans and, and then learning from it, learning from exactly what um, Mr. Kubis had said. We're learning from what we have put in place, what our families, what our students are giving us feedback on, what our teachers, our paraprofessionals, all of our specialists are letting us um, know. We've been taking that feedback and making adjustments along the way. Uh, within the area of special education, which I will talk to you about um, tonight, and, and most certainly if you have additional um, thoughts or questions for me, let me know that. But um, within special education, we've really um, taken taken the guidance from our general education partners and said, what are we looking at when we put content area information out to students in a distance learning manner? And our special education teachers have been able to take that and in collaboration with our general education teachers and work with their paraprofessionals to say, how do we make adaptations, accommodations to the work that's being sent out to our students at every level from our early childhood all the way up to our students that are in a transition work experience environment. Um, so we've been working really hand in in hand on that collaboration. Some of our students who receive a little bit more uh, special education services, um, their primary focus would be within special education. Our, our staff there, our special education teachers and paraprofessionals are reaching out to students and families kind of regularly regular uh, uh, process and pretty much in a daily process they're stepping out and calling or doing a video chat or reaching out to students and families to keep the consistency and the daily routines particularly um, daily routines that set the day and the structure of the day um, off and going um, they will do that every day of the week they've done it through multiple platforms with our families and really have learned the last couple of weeks of what is working for families and what are um, ways for us to reach families that would be a better effect, effective uh, manner for them. Um, one thing that our early childhood special education team are experts at and have been doing for many years for us is really working with family systems and working within families to provide um, information about what's working for them as a family in their home, as they're going into the community. Um, we've been really taking some cues from our early childhood special education um, teams as they have been a lead in this. We've been able to look at how do we take the information um, and get it out to families in a way that's almost a service, uh, service coordination or in a manner that assists families to implement it throughout the course of their day or their week in working with um, students who, who have different levels of disabilities. Um, we have been really working closely to do coaching. Um, lots of different formats have been used. We have used um, video formats. We've used telepractice uh, formats. We've sent home and printed off um, copies of information for students who really need the print or need large size, size print. We have that up and going, so we're able to send that out. Um, we've been able to really try to work within what families need. So multiple families may have needs that video can work or a telepractice can work, or we're really needing to do alternate ways of, of touching base with them. Our occupational uh, therapists, our physical therapists, and our uh, DAPE teachers, our developmental adaptive physical education teachers, have done an outstanding job of creating coaching videos, um, modeling videos of different um, positioning, lifts, transfers, activities that they can do. Our DAPE teachers are doing, um, it's called synchronized, but it's um, classes on, uh, on the internet. So they're able to, to have classes, kids are interacting with one another. It's been actually quite an impressive feat that our DAPE teachers have, have put into place, which is exciting to see. Um, OT and PT have been able to do coaching where families will videotape what they're doing at home or digitize it send it back and we're able to give them some pointers and some coaching along the way, which has really worked out well. Of course, uh, we're, there's always a hit and a miss with it. And so we're learning from it as we go when we're learning what works and what doesn't work. Um, so we definitely are learning as we go. Our speech language uh, clinicians have done an, a very nice job of moving forward and understanding and figuring out how to do telepractice. They've taken that on to say, how do we provide speech language therapy services in a, uh, a model, model that's either um, through a telephone or through a video chat um, with our students to do any level of modeling or practice so that kids can hear the language or see the language as they're speaking. And then they started to do small groups so kids can learn from each other and, and that kids speak um, outside of adults speak. So that's been a nice um, growth for us as we've been really putting that into place. Um, 
One of the areas that uh, we have really had some work around is the work that our paraprofessionals have done to support our classroom teachers. And not only our classroom teachers in special education, but our general education teachers as well. But they are taking assignments, they're making adaptations, accommodations, they're creating videos, they're creating um, Google um, Sheets or Google um, uh, documents for them to be able to send out to students. They're doing, um, they're touching in with families and really finding out what are some of the needs of the families. Um, I, we, we do take continual feedback, so I know there are areas in which we, we can continue to improve and continue to support our families that are having um, some additional needs that we haven't quite mastered or quite got our hands around. Um, but we definitely are taking, taking those, uh, those suggestions in. And so our teachers and our paraprofessionals our related service providers, speech, OT, PT, DAPE, are really getting actively involved with families um, to the limits of which uh, families can, can manage, right? We're all, we're all busy. And I was chuckling as Andy was giving his presentation earlier today, I was in a, in a problem solving meeting with him and my three children were running behind us. And I was thinking, okay, distance learning at its best at the McIntyre home. So we, it was good. Um, so with that, I, I wanted to go over at least the, the breadth of what we're doing in special education. There's a lot of little pieces moving at the same time, but we really are taking input and feedback from our students, input and feedback from our families, as well as from the, the teachers and the paraprofessionals, which we work from. We are, we're learning every day and we're, sometimes we, we knock it out of the park and sometimes we're, we're missing and we're really needing to shore that up and figure out what to do next with it. So, so with that, I will end my, my report to the school board for tonight and I will pass it on to Executive Director Rick Kaufman at this time. Rick? Jennifer, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, Superintendent Fujitaki, members of the board and the uh, viewing audience. I think there are two hallmarks to the, our work this year um, on the response to the COVID-19. Uh, uh, the first is that uh, we've we've tried to predict and or look at a crystal ball that is ever changing as to how we address uh, the various different aspects of the strategies and tactics, if you will, of, of the work that we're doing in all, all facets of the district. Um, so it, as Superintendent Fujitaki indicated and, and others have mentioned, we had a pretty good idea that should the governor extend the uh, school closure till the end of the year that we needed to be prepared. So what I'm going to br very briefly share with you tonight is that at the end of the school year, we have developed a framework and a and a process of planning uh, to what that end of the year looks like. Not only from uh, what Mr. Kubis talked about end of di end of distance learning, but um, how do we get student and district property into the rightful owners uh, when that school year ends, knowing that it's very different than most of the, than all of our previous ending of the school years. So we have developed uh, the framework of what's called Operation Student and District Property. Um, we have gathered feedback from uh, staff and others as we've developed that framework and, and uh, we shared it with our principals uh, last night and we've given them till Wednesday to provide additional feedback as well as members of the cabinet so that we can put together the best possible plan for each grade level, including Pond and Southwood, um, middle school and high school, and then what that looks like and, and uh, how do we go about that process. So you'll be hearing more about that in the next couple of days, uh, maybe perhaps by the end of the week or early next week as we finalize that. Uh, both Jennifer and Andy have talked about um, our staff and bringing closure as well as for our students. And so part of the, this plan will include some components that allows our staff not only to, and students not only to bring some closure, but to see each other, um, to say goodbye at the end of the year. Um, and so we're working on that plan. So um, we are, uh, we're thankful um, for the, the, for the patients that, you and our parents and students have provided um, and for the grace they've provided as we continue to work through these very, very difficult and challenging uh, responses. So um, at that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Executive Director of Technology and Information Services, Mr. John Weiser. Thanks, Rick. Uh, good evening, Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, board members. The purpose of my comments tonight are to give you and our viewers an update on the technology supports that we have in place since the last time we talked a couple weeks ago for students and staff. I got three updates for you tonight. 
since we last met. Uh, update number one is around tech repair and support. As I shared at our last board meeting, we have in place a tech help phone number. We have an email address and we have a text address for families and staff. We've seen the number of requests uh, for support stabilize over the last two weeks. And so now we're getting about half of the help request that we did at the start of distance learning. I, I see that as a good sign that people are, as uh, Director Kubis said, finding their groove and uh, you know learning to, to troubleshoot uh, these new times. At our tech exchange, this is the three day a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday pick up and drop off service for physical tech repair. We've also seen those numbers stabilize. They, they rose uh, over about a three week period and we're, we're now leveled off serving about 120 families and students and staff uh, on a weekly basis. Update number two is about internet access. Uh, from the last time we've talked, uh, we have about 300 Wi-Fi hotspots in circulation for families who need internet access through distance learning. This represents 75 more than we had uh, during the normal school year. We added 75 in the last couple of weeks. The wait list for those hotspots has uh, stabilized around 20 or so. We have, at any given point, we have about 20 families waiting for a hotspot. It takes us about two days to turn around those requests uh, to get the equipment in, to get to prep it, and to get it out to families. Uh, and then one, one last update in that regard is that we have uh, 100 more internet hotspots expected to be delivered this week. So we're trying to stay ahead of this hotspot issue um, to get us to help us finish the year strong. Update number three is about staff professional learning. Uh, in collaboration with the professional development providers across programs and across our buildings, we have lots of expertise in this district. Um, we have a catalog now. We've built up a catalog of 50 recorded professional development sessions given by our staff. Uh, we've had over 2,000 attendees to those sessions, and that back catalog is now available to staff. In addition, we add about a dozen live sessions a dozen live sessions each week. Um, so for example, this week's topics uh, might include embedding voice recordings in Google Classroom. And this one caught my attention because it, it feels like a callback to Welcome Back, back Cotter, uh, if you know that reference. Uh, a session called Yo Teach, your digital space for student office hours and on-demand instruction. So uh, our professionals are also adjusting to these, these new uh, learning environments. In summary, uh, though we definitely have our challenges, as you've heard from, from our presenters, I'm seeing my team and other people's teams rise to the occasion. They're meeting the challenges of students and staff and, and uh, you know, it's a moment of pride for all of us. That completes my summary of the technology supports. And I will hand off to Principal Jason Anderson to talk about graduation and prom. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, John Weiser. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Superintendent Fujitaki, School Board, um, and guests. Uh, thank you for having me, giving me a few minutes, um, and then for also giving me a reason to wear a collared shirt, which is the first time in about a month. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, my topics, you know, once we got, um, kind of our academic pieces uh, that uh, Director Kubis was talking about kind of up and moving. Um, our attention did turn to uh, graduation and prom and those major spring events that we know are so important to all students, but of course seniors especially. Um, we worked very closely with our student council leaders, like Shante mentioned earlier, they were a great sounding board and had great ideas. In addition to that, we have a tremendous network of supportive parents um, in various different groups that we have been tapping into for uh, their thoughts and their feedback. Um, and all in all, a lot of our work, whether it's uh, graduation or prom or some of the other uh, senior celebration things that we're doing, is very much a crowdsourced project. So we're very, we're very proud of that. Um, specific to graduation, uh, obviously the biggest event probably for um, all of us to work through. Um, we went through many drafts. I want to thank Rick Kaufman and his team for helping us with that. Um, we're we're pretty much ready to to present our draft. But the the highlight plan or the highlight our plan for you all is that we are prepared to uh, uh, offer three plans for graduation. Um, and the first two really are plays off each other. And those are 
a June graduation ceremony um, at Lincoln Stadium in which we can seat kids on the field. We should be able to se separate them with some uh, good social distancing and then hopefully allowing for one or two um, guests in the stands. We'll, we'll do some math and we'll, we'll work on the stands piece. But um, we are looking at a date of June 20th for our um, event. And that would be both Kennedy and Jefferson. I believe Kennedy is slotted to go at like noon and Jefferson slotted to go at 3.30 or four in the afternoon. Um, uh, and then we have, uh, uh, that's a Saturday, June 20th. And then June 21st is a uh, Sunday, same plan, but that is our sort of our weather makeup day. Um, and if hopefully we'll know somewhere in early June if we're going to be permitted to do that plan. And then if we are, then we're, we're, we're full steam ahead on the June plan. Um, if for one reason or another, um, uh, June, uh, that date in June does not work out, we have another set of dates reserved in July. Uh, that's the 18th and 19th. Same plan. We are proposing to do our graduation ceremony uh, at Lincoln Stadium. Uh, Kennedy going first, Jefferson going in the afternoon. The 18th is a Saturday. Um, with uh, the 19th, the Sunday saved as a, a weather makeup day. Hopefully, if there's restrictions in June, our hope is that by uh, you know a month later, those restrictions would have been lifted or at least uh, relieved a little bit where we could do a plan still along for, for social distancing. Um, there's a lot more details that we'll work through on our plan. I don't think you uh, are, are super concerned with those those nitty gritty details, but we are working on all those as well. And once we're, once we're going ahead, we'll continue to work with our student council uh, seniors and parents to fine tune everything. Um, in addition to that, we are creating a digital program for our students, uh, for our seniors. Uh, we will begin that project soon. Um, in a best case scenario, our June graduation goes off, our July, our July graduation, uh, we, can, we can do one of those. This, this digital program will be a nice parting gift for our seniors. If a worst case scenario happens and the governor does not allow us or the government does not allow us to do any of that, at least we will have this and we'll work with BEC TV and others to, to, to sort of uh, present that digital program. Um, but we're gonna be working on that digital program regardless. Best case scenario, it's a gift. Um, worst case scenario, it's at least something that we can use to honor our seniors. Um, that is uh, our plan for graduation. Um, but as far as prom goes, we did work through a couple different scenarios. We did talk with our senior student council kids. We did talk with our uh, parents on how important it was to try to be creative with that. Ultimately, most of our stakeholders said, you know, if you can do it, nice. If not, it's not that big of a deal. Um, uh, and it looks like based on the rules that we're seeing from the state that we are not going to be able to, to, to do a prom of, of really any sort. Um, so I think our official line is going to be that prom will be canceled. That is my update on prom and graduation. I'll look forward to questions later on, but that is my update on prom and graduation. And I am kicking it off to Dr. Jenna Mitchler. Thank you, Principal Jason Anderson. Good evening, Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, members of the board, public. So I'm uh, introducing us to the next sec section of updates here, which is about summer school. And so the purpose is to give you some updates and some information about our summer programming. So I'll start by saying that the, the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, presents some uncertainty about our usual summer planning and our summer operations. Nonetheless, our district is, um, we're committed to student learning and we are committed to doing everything we can to conduct the summer programming in person if possible or in an alternate format if that's feasible. So uh, our summer programming, just to give a little overview, includes multiple programs. So we have targeted services for our elementary and secondary students. We have credit recovery at our high school level. We have special education and extended school year services. And we have summer galaxy and middle school summer programming. So right now we are waiting for more guidance from the Minnesota Department of Education about summer programs and if we'll be allowed to operate. We're also waiting for a communication and guidance from MDE on funding, and that will help us know how to move forward with our, our summer programming. So that's the update I have for you right now. I'm going to turn it over to the Executive Director of Community Education, Jake Winshaw. Thank you, Dr. Mitchler. Good evening, Chair Corman, Board, Superintendent Fujitaki. In community education, we've really remained just in a holding pattern without much guidance or clarity. We continue to operate as if we will get the go ahead really any day um, to resume our program when the when the executive order re expires. Yet we approach it cautiously, knowing that that's you know there's a good chance that this mo might move into the summer. Um, we're making alternative plans uh, for summer and potentially as we move into the next school year. 
as a revenue-based program, uh, we're looking through projections as to what return to operations might look like and the budget ramifications because of that. We are looking at our budget for 2021 currently with numerous options as far as um, how slowly do things come back? Are people going to have the income to, um, to, to enroll in our experiences or to uh, need child care and stuff like that? So um, I must say hats off to our staff for the work they've done. It's been a very challenging time and often frustrating time for them. Um, they've been very flexible and they've had positive attitudes throughout. Many times the plans that we're working on today are gonna change tomorrow and, and they all know that too, but they're doing this um, with the right intentions and they're doing a good job with that. So hats off to them. Some of the things that we're working on um, as we've had to cancel all of our all of our experiences throughout the rest of the school year, um, staff's working on alternative me methods to deliver those services. Alex Locke and Michelle Glenn and Enrichment have been working hard to not only cancel current classes, but working with instructors to offer an online version of the class if it's possible. Um, so they're doing that throughout the rest of April and May, but they're also looking at summer, knowing that there's a good chance that things might look different as summer comes in. Um, in early childhood, Gina Miller and her staff have worked hard to offer distance learning and keep in touch with those families. They're doing some really cool things with uh, reading stories to kids still and um, doing those type of things. So working hard in early childhood as well to keep those connections with families. Metro South, which is our adult basic ed, they've moved to online classes as well. And uh, they're a little bit fortunate that they had been doing that a little bit in recent years. So um, it wasn't something that was completely new to them. So um, adult English classes, adult diploma, career pathways, and college prep um, have all gone to online classes right now. And some of those classes that will spill into summer as well. We do have plans to continue into summer currently. Uh, Mike Larson and his crew in building reservations have canceled all rentals throughout May. Um, they're working hard to get these rental groups to reschedule um, for summer. We'd love to see a lot of these groups um, reschedule for summer because it's a great revenue generating source. Mike's worked really hard to increase the, the rentals and uh, it'd be really nice to keep those on the books. So to summarize, it's been a challenging to project where things are going. Um, right now, we kind of keep saying it's a guessing game. We really don't know where things are heading. So we need to prepare to resume operations, but when does that happen? Um, what does the response from families look like when that time comes? Our families going to be come back. Our families going to be working. Are they going to be willing to to enter their kids into a class or a camp where they're not social distancing, or will they have to social distance? And we can only have small groups of people in a room. Um, obviously, this is not unique to, to Bloomington Public Schools. As you know, the city of Bloomington has canceled many of their summer programs. And I've reached out to other nearby community eds, and none of them have made any decisions on summer yet either. So. Um, until we get more clarity on where things are going, um, we just continue to plan and continue to have our fingers crossed that this um, that we can get back to normal sometime soon. So that's the end of my report. I'll turn it over to Renetta Renford on grab and go grab and go meals. Great, um, thank you. I appreciate that, Jake. So um, my update that we have that I have for you regarding the grab and go meals is we're going to continue with the process that we're currently doing. Um, the question is, is what does the scale look like for summer feeding program? And of course, that's to be no, um, it's unknown as for now. We also need to make sure that we're balance the, balancing the needs versus our cost. Um, we're waiting from both the state and the federal level to find out guidance on, on those issues as well. The good news is the summer could be bigger um, than it has been in the previous years. So that's, that's great news to hear. Um, I want to give a big shout out to our incredible food service staff and the custodians and the paras and the bus drivers. Um, upper administration is helping out. So with that being said, we've had um, the number of breakfasts and lunches that we have served up and as of today is just over 171,000 meals. So we have reached to quite a few people. So that's very impressive. And um, I got just a little bit of a poem for it like I did last time. So nutrition is packed in a snack in a sack, excuse me, includes a breakfast and a snack, along with a hot lunch. Team Bloomington, we are proud of this bunch. So thank you anyways. And so that's just a quick little update I have for you. And then with that being said, here is Julie Kinsella. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Renetta. Thank you, Madam Chair, Superintendent Fujitaki, board members and viewing public. I'm giving an update on our childcare. So presently we are serving over 50 students each day or that have enrolled in our program. Thank you to Jenna, 
um, Mitchler, Jennifer, McIntyre, Hannah Hatch for their support to help what, keep things going smoothly there. It has been going fairly smoothly. One of our challenges is social distancing, especially with our kindergarten and preschools. But we've actually today even put X's in the rooms and told kids they can find the X and <laughs> stay on those. So it helped. We have pool noodles that one of the nurses brought for each classroom that show the six feet. So we're really working hard on that. We have activities. To, that are individual that the kids can do on their own to again maintain that social distance. We've been working hard to encourage the distance learning and it's been going really well. The first couple of weeks were challenging but now we've kind of got a, a, a pattern going with them. We still have some kids that'll tell us they did everything and the next day we find out they didn't but we're still working through and we'll keep checking them. I cannot say thank you enough to the Poplar Bridge staff. Mr. Cantu has been so supportive. Marco, Jessica, and Brennan, the custodians, and Joan Hubbard, the cook, have been amazing help for us too. Um, we plan to continue this care through the end of the school year. Uh, summer, as you've already heard, is very uncertain for us. It all depends on what we find out as we move forward and how we can go on. Some of the factors we have to think about, again, are the social distancing, the limited numbers in classrooms and, and the buildings as a whole. So we just have to wait for more guidance on that. So we will wait for that. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Superintendent Fujitaki. Last year, muted. Okay, sorry. Thank you, everyone, for your presentations and all your hard work. Every day, these leaders have to answer immense questions. In fact, they have to come up with multiple possible answers to a single question, only to find out the question changes the next day. So, keeping with all those tough questions, I will now invite the board to ask questions. The chair and I have agreed that I will triage questions to the appropriate leader to respond to, to facilitate the, ask, the asking and answering of questions. I'll call on a board member in turn for his or her question. And after the initial round, I'll ask again the board members if they have other questions. So I'll start with board member BB. If you have a question, please pose your question. How many students are in a room with the uh, child care and, um, and what are strategies that you're using to keep them distanced? I'll invite Julie Kinsella to respond to that question, please. Yes, we have no more than eight students in a classroom because we have one to two teachers, depending on if we have a one-on-one -on -one in that classroom. And then as far as strategies, again, we've like we in today just put X's and things like X's on the ground that are six feet apart, the pool noodles. It's been constantly, we have the kids kind of stretch their arms out to make sure that they're having that um, distancing between them. That's constant reminders with the, with the kids too. Well, remember, B, we hope we answered your question. Do you have a follow-up related question? No, thank you. Okay, moving on, Vice Chair Bennett, your question, please. I have no questions at this time. Oh, great. Moving on, Board Member Sorum, please pose your question. Jim, you have to unmute. Yep. Uh, mine is mainly concerned with, I think it's the grading and or um, achievement that we've heard about a little bit. And I know the commissioner is still trying to figure out exactly what it is. I realize that each district must probably determine their own systems in order to do it. But with a governor who's covering all 900 students, 900,000 students in different uh, districts, I'm sure he's getting quite a quite a bit of response to you know the pass fail versus a, a letter grade in all three elementary, middle school, and senior high. Who wants to help me understand that? Uh, Andy Kovas, could you handle that question, please? Yeah, most most definitely. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Director Sorum, you're absolutely right that uh, the governor's in, in an interesting position and then also the commissioners, they have to kind of decipher and get through what, what's going to happen with this. Uh, to date, they've not offered a lot of guidance uh, on, on this topic. Uh, they've hinted that they're going to, but we haven't received anything yet. And so, 
I would say 99% of school districts. Uh, I just received a, uh, an email forwarded to me from a, a, a Western suburb school district who made a decision about what they're going to do. Many school districts have been left to make their own decision about what they're going to do, uh, whatever it fits best with their community, and that's what we did. So I, I talked about the problem solving team, the distance learning problem solving team. We spent a lot of time talking about this topic, making sure that uh, we took into consideration all of the feedback, uh, as well as making sure that we met the needs of all of our of our students and families. When we came to our decision about what we would be doing around uh, grading and assessments. Does that answer your question? Yes. Board yeah. Member yes, thank you very much. Great. Moving on, Board Member Starks, your question is welcome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering, actually, if we can get just a little bit more detail from Mr. Kubis um, about the um, grades versus pass no credit and how those decisions are gonna be made for students. Andy, please. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we got there. And so again, I keep referencing the distance learning problem solving team, but uh, what we garnered through feedback and, and uh, decisions that were made were that we did not want to put um, students in positions where uh, they didn't have any control. So we know quite honestly, in our community, there are uh, students and families who are in dire need and um, don't have the ability necessarily uh, because they're trying to survive in this. There's a, a scenario I know at Kennedy High School where we've got a student who uh, parents were both laid off and they have to go to work uh, to be able to provide for their family. And so we know that that's one we've heard about, but there are many, many others. And so we want to make sure that students aren't penalized for the fact that they are in a distance learning environment where they don't have the ability to put all the time into school because of life circumstances. And so um, at the same time, we also know that we have families across our city who are very motivated by grades and who think that grades are, are extremely important for what they do. And so we want to make sure um, that, that that gets looked after as well. So we know other school districts have gone to um, straight grades and then you can opt in uh, to a pass no credit. Uh, we decided as that committee that we would do it the other way, that we wouldn't penalize people. And then we have a mechanism that's almost ready to be released, Dr. Starks, about how students will be able and families be able to make that decision. Some of the highlights around that is we want to make sure that we give families as much time as possible to make their decision. And so that they're not making a decision in haste and then three weeks later thinking, boy, I wish we had decided something different to both ends. And so that's coming out very, very soon. In fact, I, I'm guessing it'll be out uh, later this week about how that will happen. From an elementary standpoint, when it comes to grades, we know that uh, assessments measure students' mastery of their academic standards. And for a seven or an eight-year-old student at home, we just can't say with confidence that they have mastered a standard without our professional being right beside them. Again, for lots of different reasons. Because of this, we have some students who don't have the support that they'd have at school, and so they're left to their own. And that's, uh, you know, they have either been used to support or uh, as they, they might legally get support through their IEP. And so what are we doing to make sure that that's happening? So we don't want to penalize students uh, and as far as that goes. And the other piece is we just want to make sure that we also have some families who've got extra support. Now mom and dad are home and maybe grandma and grandpa and uncle lives there too and they've got five adults helping them. We can't discern how much knowledge is theirs as opposed to what they're being helped with. And so because of that, we've made the decision that we would not offer a traditional report card, but instead we would offer uh, a check-in with the family at the end of the year and talk about the progress as it got to uh, March 13th. Or Mary Starks, do you have a related follow-up question? I do not. Thank you very much for all your information. Board Member Steigoff, your question, please. Board Member Steigoff? Yeah, I have no questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, student Board Member Shante Brown, you have a question? I have no questions as of now. Okay. Student Board Member Kelly Starks, you have a question? Oh, 
Oh, can't hear you, Allie. Good. Are we good now? Yes. Okay. Sorry, it's the headphones. Um, so will we be refunded for the money that we put into like parking passes, lunch accounts, other things like that? Or where will that money be? Oh, good. Rod, could you please field that question? Yes, uh, we're working on a process to be able to handle that right now. Um, we've we've asked the uh, each of the sites to provide us a list of areas that need to be refunded, and we're looking at a process of how to make those refunding because it could be if a person paid it through a credit card service, we could do, we could easily do it back through the credit cards. The issue comes down to is if it was cash or paid by a check of making sure that we have documentation of that to be able to refund it to the right people. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, um, Chair Corman, do you have a question? I do not have any questions at this moment. Thank you. Thank you all for the information. Time, I'll go one more time around the horn and see if anyone has a question. Uh, Board Member Beebe, do you have a question? No more questions. Great. Okay, Vice Chair Bennett. No questions. Board Member Sorum. No questions. Board Member Starks. No questions. Okay. Board Member Steigoff. No questions. Okay, Student Board Member Shante Brown. No questions. Right. Student Board Member Ali Starks. Yes, I do have one more question. Um, okay, this is for Principal Anderson. Um, are we getting feedback? I know you talked about getting um, feedback from like the Jefferson Student Council. Um, are we also getting feedback from Kennedy students and like making sure that like we're involved with these decisions and these like, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'll, say, uh, I'll say this. I speak to uh, this camp, uh, I don't think it's echoing happening but um i speak to principal camp up probably a couple of times a day and so where our processes are very similar um so i i guess i don't want to speak too much on how she is processing things but i can assure you they're very similar that these big decisions um she's led them through very similar um uh stakeholder groups thank you my sincere apologies to board member Olson. You have a question, please. I actually do not have a question, just a thank you to everyone. Okay. Great. I too thank everyone for their questions. I'm um, now turning the microphone over to Chair Corman. Thank you, Superintendent Fujitaki. And thank you all for the information you have brought to us tonight. On behalf of the school board, we are grateful for the great work our district and school teams continue to provide to support our students and families and each other. Your efforts to ensure that our students continue to receive the academic and support services needed during this challenging time and how we are serving families through childcare and school meals is truly inspiring. I've said this before, there is no doubt this current situation is showing our nation how crucial public education is to our society. This is demonstrated each day. I want to let you know how grateful we are to the parents, guardians, and the community for working together with our schools. Your patience, understanding, and willingness to adapt has been invaluable as we navigate this shift in education. Bloomington is strong because you are strong. And I'll repeat that because I think that's, that's, that is very true. Bloomington is strong because you're strong. In these difficult times, we are called to remain strong and united and to work as a team. So while social distancing may keep us physically apart, our commitment to one another as a community keeps us together and together we will prevail. Please be safe. Thank you. Now I will continue with our agenda. So next in our agenda, we have Beta War Jefferson High School Fire Alarm Replacement. 
This item will be presented by Brad Sitovich, our Executive Director of Finance and Support Services. And I am gonna move to my window where I can see everybody's face. And uh, if you might raise your hand, please, if you would like to read this resolution. Madam Chair. Yes, Director Olson, go ahead. Okay, be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 271 accepts a bid of $178,875 for fire alarm replacement at Jefferson High School from Johnson Controls Fire Protection in Plymouth, Minnesota. Is there a second? Second, yes. Steigoff. Second by Director Steigoff. All the, um, no, well, yeah. Oh, I'm losing my thread. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna hear now. Uh, we're gonna listen now to the, um, Mr. Radzitovich. I think I'm paying too much attention to the, the messages being sent. Chair Corman, Superintendent okay, Fukusaki, uh, board members. Uh, this is a part of our normal all facility programming. Um, this uh, improvement is uh, to upgrade the technology within uh, the only two schools that haven't been upgraded other than this are Normandale Hills and Westwood. We uh, actually did Kennedy uh, last summer. So this is just a process uh, through our deferred maintenance program to make sure we're updating the technology uh, within the buildings. Thank you. I will now ask um, school board members if you have any questions. So, Director Beebe, do you have any questions? No questions. Director Bennett? No questions. Director Olson? No questions. Director Sorum? Director Sorum? No questions. Boy, that mute button is hard. <laughs> Director Stark? I'm not sure. I see Director Starks. She at the moment. We might have lost her, maybe. Okay, Director Steigoff, do you have any questions? No questions. Okay, and I don't have any questions. I see Director Starks is back. Director Starks, do you have any questions? Director Starks, do you have any questions for Mr. Sitkovich? I do not. <clears throat> okay. And I don't have any questions at the moment. So all those in favor of approving this resolution, please say aye. 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 Uh, anybody oppose? Okay, I don't hear any opposition to this resolution, so that will be approval approved. Okay, that one has been approved. Now I'll move into my next item. Okay, next item is the 2020-2021 Vendors and Rates for District Group Insurance. And um, the administrator presented here will be Mary Burroughs, Executive Director of Human Resources. Will someone please read the resolution? I see Director Steiger raising her hand. Go ahead, Director Steiger. Madam, Madam Chair. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District number 271 approves the vendors and rates for district group insurance for the 12 month period from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021 per the attached memo. Number one, preferred one, third party administrator for self-funded health insurance. Number two, preferred one insurance company reinsurance for self-funded health insurance. Number three, Fairview employee assistance program. Number four, health equity, health savings accounts provider. Number five, Delta Dental, third-party administrator for self-funded dental insurance. Number six, Hartford long-term disability insurance. Number seven, Hartford life insurance. Number eight, one digital benefits consultant. Number nine, benefit extras, Inc. benefits administrator for retiree COBRA and flex spending. Number 10, VOYA critical care insurance program. And number 11, voluntary 
programs. Thank you. Mrs. Burris? Yes, uh, Chair Carmen, Superintendent for Jataki and members of the school board and public. Um, this is our annual renewal of our insurance rates that we bring forward annually. Um, things to highlight, I don't want to go over this in detail, every single thing, but things to note um, are health equity, Delta Dental, One Digital, Benefit Extras, VOYA, and all of our voluntary programs remain flat. So there's no increase associated with any of those programs, which is good. Um, we did have a slight increase in our uh, administrative fee through Preferred One and also our specific stop loss uh, premium but nothing that the self-funded plan can't handle. Um, the employee assistance program did decrease by 16% their rate, so that did decrease. And also to note, we did change our long-term disability and life insurance um, vendor to the Hartford rather than VOYA based on the bids that we received. And those were gone over and approved by an insurance committee. Um, and so they did uh, approve the change mainly because we're saving about 85,000. Um, so that's a, a huge plus and they do have a really reputable uh, service and reputation. Those are really the highlights of the insurance pieces. Any questions? Okay, do board members have any questions? I'll start with um, Director Bennett. Madam, Madam Chair. Can I, I did not mm -hmm. hear a second. Was there a second on that motion? And I Correct, yeah, I apologize. Uh, we'll do the, the second once we go over the questions. Is that okay? okay. I, I think both members what's... need to mute your microphone. We got a few board members that need to mute their microphones. Thank you, because otherwise I get an echo. Thank you. Um, so, Director Bennett, you said you had no questions, correct? Correct, no questions. Okay, Director Olson? No questions. Director Sorum? Yes, as a member of the uh, insurance committee meeting, when we did have the discussion on it, everything was uh, pretty well covered and appreciate the good work that um, our vendors have done in order to provide uh, Rod and Mary all of the information that is necessary for all of the groups that participate. So I just wanted to uh, reiterate and, and second or third, whatever has been said. Okay, I see now that our student representatives need to leave. So we will say goodbye to them. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Have a good night. Thank you, you too, good night. have a good night. Thanks for being here. Uh, okay, thank you, Director Sorum. We'll go to Director Starks. Do you have any questions? I have no questions. Okay, Director Steiger. No questions. Director Bibi. No questions. Okay, and I don't have any questions. Um, thank you. So is there a second for this resolution? Second, Beth Beebe. Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favor of approving this resolution, please say aye. Raise your hand so I can see you too. Aye. 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 Okay. Anybody oppose? Okay, I see all board members there and I don't see anybody opposed, so this resolution has passed. Okay, thank you. Now we're gonna move into our next item. This is resolution to non-renew probationary teachers. And uh, with us, we have once again, Mary Burris, Executive Director of Human Resources. And one of the board members is going to read the resolution. I'm sure. Go ahead, Director Bennett. <clears throat> okay, be resolved, the School Board of Independent School District number 271 pursuant to Minnesota Statute 122A.40 that the teaching contract of each of the named probationary teachers listed below in Independent School District number 271 is hereby terminated at the close of the current 2019-2020 school year, June 30th, 2020, 
and it is non-renewed for the 2020-2021 school year, be it resolved further that the clerk of the school board shall issue written, written notice to said teacher regarding non-renewal of the teacher's contract as provided by law, and that said notice shall be substantially in the following form. Notice of termination. You are hereby notified that a regular meeting of the School Board of Independent School District number 271 held April 27, 2020, a resolution was adopted by a majority roll call vote giving action that your teaching contract will not be renewed effective at the end of the school year, June 30th, 2020, and is not renewed for the 2020-2021 school year. Said action of the board is taken pursuant to MS 122A.40. You may officially request that the school board gives its reason for the non-renewal of your teaching contract. However, such request must be received within 10 days after the recipient after the receipt of this notification. Further, I move the approval of a separate resolution to non-renew all the named probationary teachers and vote as one. Shannon Badgaglia, Caroline Bayard, Paul Benson, Lisa Brunhut, Nancy Buller, Christina Kyer, Amanda Chambers, Kelsey Christofferson, Scott Cummings, Sarah Dullum, Jamie Drayling, Andrea Dye, Kyle Fearling, or Fearing, Jessica Fustel, Laura Franklin, Amy Freeberg, Rachel Hansen, Carrie Hefstlin, Hef Hefenstein, um, Katrina Herring, Trevor Hess, Claire Johnson, Jennifer W. Johnson, Laura Katovich, Patricia Lang, Sarah, Sarah Mazzoni, Catherine Mendoza, Morgan Maurer, Kelsey Meyer, Sophia Michelou, Eric Nelson, uh, Lena Pig, Pignatel, Pignatelio, uh, Carolyn Prentice, Courtney Ramirez, Melody Sandal, Kimberly Suddeth, Natalie Seiler, Kenwan Tran, Heather Van Buskirk, Emily Bison, Faith Volturn, Volturno Alt, Sarah Wang, Rebecca Wiseman, Lauren Whitleridge, Julie Yonke, and Michelle Young. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second, stack off. Okay, you can go ahead, uh, Mary Burns. Yes, yes uh, Chair, Chair Corman, Superintendent, Superintendent for Jataki and members of the board and viewing public. public. Um, this, this is, is a, a resolution, resolution that I bring forward every year uh, to talk about non-renewal of probationary staff. Um, this year is uh, more numerous that we had to do due to budget reductions. So you will see more numbers or people on here regarding that as far as cuts and also changes in programming. So um, any questions? Um, I'll start this time with um, Director Olson. Do you have any questions? No, I do not. Director, Director Sorum? Sorum? No, no questions. questions. Director Starks? No, no questions. questions. Director, Director Steiger? No, no question. question. Director Bibi? No, no questions. questions. Director Bennett? No questions. And I don't have any questions. So all those in favor of approving this resolution, please say hi. And <laughs> please say aye. <laughs> and I, um, I believe we have to do the Roll call here, so, so we'll do that. So, so I, I will start, start with um, Director Bibi. Yes, I. Director Bennett. Yes. Director Olson. I. Director Sorum. I. Director Starks. I. Director Steigaf. I. And um, Director Corman. I.
So this resolution has been approved. We're going into the next one. And that is resolution proposing to place tenured teachers on partial unrequested leave of absence. Will someone read the resolution, please? Can someone raise a hand to read the resolution? Director Sorum. Sure. Be it resolved, attach our resolutions proposing to place tenured teachers on partial unrequested leave of absence. I move the approval of a separate resolution proposing to place tenured teachers on partial unrequested leave of absence and vote as one. Perry Rudy, Jean, Jillian Sullivan, and Caitlin Waters. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it was second by um, Director Bennett, I believe. Um, yes. yes, Mayor Burris, please go ahead. So this is a continuation of the um, cuts that we had to do this year. And so we have three tenure teachers that we had to partially reduce from their current FTE. So that's what you're seeing on this resolution. Thank you. Are there any questions? Director, Director Sorum, do you have any questions? No, other than just to note that, you know, the, the um, reductions are all basically the same. So as we, even though there are three people, it is basically just the one resolution pertaining to all three the same way. Thank you, Director Sorum. Director Starks, do you have any questions? No questions. Director Steiger? No question. Director Bibi? No questions. Director Bennett? No questions. Director Olson? No questions. And I don't have any questions. All those in favor of approving this resolution, please say aye. And I will start with Director Bibi. Aye. Director, Director Bennett. Bennett. Aye. Director, Director Olson. Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Stark. Aye. Director Steiger. Aye. And aye. So, so the, the resolution, resolution has been approved. Been um, and now we move over to our next one. Okay, I think I have this one. If it's the right one, resolution proposing to place tenure teachers on unrequested leave of absence. Would someone read the resolution, please? Director Starks, I see your hand up. Attached are resolutions proposing to place tenured teachers on unrequested leaves of absence. I move the approval of a separate resolution proposing to place tenured teachers on unrequested leave of absence and vote as one. Mary Ann Boniface, Melissa Maloney, William Tabor. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Bennett. Second by Bennett. Um, yeah, Mary, go ahead. Yeah, this is the last uh, resolution coming forward regarding changes in staff for next year. Um, so these are tenured individuals that are on full uh, leave of absence. Okay, thank you. Director Steigaff, do you have any questions? No question. Director Bibi. No, no questions. questions. Director Bennett. No questions. Director Olson? No questions. Director Sorum? No questions. Director Starks? No questions. And I don't have any questions. So all those in favor of approving this resolution, please say aye. Director Bibi? Aye. Director Bennett? Aye. Director Olson? Aye, aye. Director Sorum? Sorum? Aye. Director Starks? Aye. 
Director Steiger. Director Steiger. Aye. Aye. Okay, okay. Resolution has passed. Moving to the next one. Okay, our next one is policy 410 family and medical leave. And for this one, once again, we have Mary Burroughs. And would someone like to read the resolution, please? I need someone to read the resolution. Okay, Director Olson, we'll go with you. Okay, Madam Chair. Um, be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 271 approves no changes to policy 410, family and medical leave. Second, Steigoff. It was second by Steigoff. Mary Burns. Okay, Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, and members of the board and viewing public. This is a annual policy that we do re review. It is uh, regarding family and medical leave and the laws around that and what's required of the district to do. Um, this is a, a required mandatory policy. And so as such, we do follow the, the guidance of the state um, MSBA guidance. And there has been no changes in this policy since last year, so I am not recommending any changes at this time. Yes, thank you. Any questions, Director Beebe? No questions. Director Bennett. No questions. Director Olson. No questions. Director Sorum. No questions. Director Starks. No questions. Director Steiger. No question. And I don't have any questions. Um, all those in favor of approving this resolution, please say aye. Um, we'll start again with Director Bibi. Aye. Bennett. Aye. Olson. Aye. Sorum. Aye. Starks. Aye. Steiger. Aye. aye. Corman, aye. Okay, okay, this, this resolution, resolution has been approved. Been approved. Next, Next one. Next, Next item. item. Okay. Here it is. Policy 413, harassment and violence. Would someone like to read this resolution, please? Director Starks. Resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 271 approves no changes to policy 413, harassment and violence. Is there a second? Second. It was second by Director Olson. Okay. Uh, Mayor Bartz. Again, this is another uh, policy that we, we review annually. It is required uh, by the Minnesota School Board Association and we do follow their model language. Since there hasn't been any change in the model in the past year, I'm not recommending any changes currently. Okay. Any questions? Director Beebe? No questions. Director Bennett? No. Director Olson? No questions. Director Sorum? No questions. Director Starks? No questions. Director Steiger? No question. And I don't have any questions. All those in favor of approving this resolution, please say aye. I'll go really quick here, one by one. Uh, Bibi? Yes, aye. Bennett? Aye. Olson? Aye. Sorum? Aye. Starks? Aye. Steiger? Aye. Corman? Aye. This resolution has been approved. Our next one. Policy 531, the Pledge of Allegiance. Could someone please read the resolution? I see, I believe it was Director Steigoff. Did we lose Director Steigoff? We did. Did someone else? Uh, oh no, she's okay. back. Oh. She's back. <laughs> Go ahead, Director Steigoff, you can read. Sorry, I decided I should leave, I guess. 
Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 271 approves no changes to policy 531, the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, is there a second? Second. second. Was that Director Olson? Yes, it was second by Director Olson, I believe. Okay. Um, have here. Okay, for this one, we don't have Mary, we have Dr. Jenna Mitchler, Assistant Superintendent. Good evening again, uh, Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, members of the board and viewing public. So this is a mandatory review of Policy 531, the Pledge of Allegiance. It's a routine review. Um, we currently use the MSBA model policy language for the most part, and it has not changed. So we're also recommending no changes this time around. Very good, thank you. Are there any questions, board members? Director Bibi. No questions. Director Bennett. No. Director Olson. No questions. Director Sorum. No questions, but I will just add that the policy committee did meet and reviewed all these policies and were, were comfortable with the arrangements and so therefore there weren't any questions that we needed to ask. Am I right, Director? Director Bennett? That is correct. I was going to say that in the board member report, but that's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's fine. Okay. Well, thank you to the policy committee. Director Starks, do you have any questions? No questions. Director Steiger? No question. And I don't have any questions. So all those in favor of approving this resolution, please say aye. Director Bibi. Aye. Bennett. Aye. Olson. Aye. Sorum. Aye. Starks. Aye. Steiger. Aye. And aye. I don't think we have any opposition. So uh, the resolution has been passed. Okay. okay, we have next in the agenda, came to the end of all of our action items, board member reports. Who would like to start with your board member reports? I'm seeing a little bit different this time, but yes, Director Sorum. Thank you. Um, other than the insurance committee, which you heard, and the policy committee, I also attended the um, community education advisory committee. And we have a couple new members of that. And so that's getting to be a, a good advisory committee. Unfortunately, it was Jake Winchell's first time to speak to the group. And naturally, he was uh, concerned about what he had gotten himself into with all of the uh, new happenings around with COVID-19 and all of the possible changes that might be available because of, of the um, fund balance being fund balance for not part of the general fund. We have to wait for the uh, Department of Education and other elected uh, officials, legislature and Department of Education. So as he mentioned during his report that it is kind of a, a tenuous situation. Hopefully we can continue the way we're doing. They do have a fund balance that is adequate to uh, take care of us um, for the upcoming year, but that's not a sure thing at all. But anyhow, it looks pretty good and everybody's on board. And so we're happy the, the, with Jake being here and the rest of the uh, advisory council in its um, comfortable uh, settings. That concludes my report. Who would like to go next? Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Director Bennett. <laughs> okay, so as uh, as Director Storm said, we did the policy committee did meet and we, we met the uh, Google Hangouts here and we just did the three policies and those were the, we did the ones that didn't require any changes. And we kind of did that strategically so that we could get to our 20 um, policies reviewed for the year, because that's what our board goal is. 
And then we kind of put the some other policies later up that we're going to be meeting on in May or June. And who knows what the will the meet in person, but we'll probably be meeting on the computer like this again. So that's kind of why we had those little simple ones there. Well, not simple, but the ones that had no changes in it. And then also um, uh, the district uh, 917 that I'm uh, also a chair, I'm not chair, but a board member on. Uh, we've had a board meeting and a uh, study session. And one thing, we did it by the computer as well, but one thing unique how they do it there is they use something called board book. And that's kind of how they, um, your board packet goes into, so everyone gets is part of the board book. And that has a pretty uh, neat feature that has a raise your hand option on there. So if you have a question, you can click the raise your hand and so the chair sees who has a question, like cues them in order. So it's a pretty slick little thing. But anyway, we also, at our study session, we were talking about um, programming and, and tuition fees next year. And one of the things that the school board did, 917 did before I came on in January was approve a plan of growth because of all of the demand and students that they have. So they were adding programming and adding classrooms and, and adding uh, more staff. And so they're moving ahead with that plan. But then when the superintendent from 917 had a, a conversation with all the other superintendents, the member districts, there was um, concern about the some of the, the cost increases, especially during the time of COVID and everyone's financials are so uncertain. So 917 is kind of scaling back some of those ambitious plans, but they still want to be able to meet the, the needs of the member districts, especially when it comes to the wait, the wait list and the streamlining of the, the intake process. So there's going to be some fee increases, but not as much as they were originally anticipating. And we haven't voted on that. So once we do, I'll keep the board informed. And that concludes my report. Anybody else who has a report? Director Bibi. Um, I have uh, been to the insurance committee meeting and went very well. And I'm thankful for the good information that gets passed on down to us. Um, the other thing is I have been active in my neighborhood, though, social distancing and connecting with uh, some of our district families. And um, I have heard good reports. I haven't heard anybody complaining. And um, so that's very significant because we have lots of kids in our neighborhood. So doing what I can just to be out there. Okay. Um, Director Staya. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, MSBA, of course, had to cancel our officer training that we were supposed to attend. And so we found out um, this just recently that they have now put together an uh, online or some version of video officer training for all of us. So we have now signed up for that. So I'm um, looking forward to that. And um, just be safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else who had a report that I saw another hand? Director Olson? Well, I just wanted to say that I'm seeing a lot um, in the community concerning the senior graduate graduation and that the community is definitely interested in what they are doing and wanting to be involved and it's very heartwarming. Very good. No one else? Director starts? Did you didn't raise your hand? Okay. All right. Well, um, it, it, the board reports are, are obviously different because we have not been able to attend numerous meetings that we used to or to go to different buildings. So I know that we're all kind of receiving a lot of information via the, the virtual platform. So I think some of those things that I've been doing as well as many of you have is um, listening to um, the Governor Waltz and one of those um, conference that he had was with MSBA. And so that was that was pretty informative. Um, but as things keep changing, you know, we keep different hearing different um, different updates. And so I have shared that information with you via email and I would encourage you to keep looking at MSBA website as well as AMSD on all those COVID-19 updates in reference to education in Minnesota. 
Uh, Director Olson also shared with us today a link for um, the, the, the webinars that are being um, offered by Minnesota Department of Education. I had the opportunity to attend the first one today at four, and it was, it was very interesting. Um, it really talked a lot about how to engage families and students during this time for during distance learning. And so I would also encourage you to take a look at those. And if you see anything that might interest you, sign up for those. Um, also, if you're not able to attend later, they will be posting the, the recording of all those sessions and you'll be able to check them out. But, you know, among some of the things that they're offering, um, some of them have to do with engagement, um, also uh, promising practices for meeting the mental health needs of students, promising practices for acquiring and effectively using technology, um, meeting the needs of students with special needs and students uh, who are learning English as a new language um, and other things. So, yeah, check it out. It's 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 very very informative and very interesting for us and you know everybody involved in education. Okay, so I think we have now superintendent report. So superintendent, thank you, Chair Corbin, two things. First, um, I'll take this opportunity to thank and recognize Tom Ringdahl and the BEC team for their support and assistance with these virtual board meetings. Second is the administration requests a motion to cancel the board study session scheduled for Monday, May 4th at 6 p.m. and then to establish a board professional development session with the Minnesota School Board Association on Monday, May 4th at 6 p.m. They have a motion, please. So moved. Second, Steigoff. Okay, it was moved by Director Bennett and then it was second by Director Steigoff. So all those in favor? Please say aye. 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 Don't think there was anybody opposed. Any anybody opposed? Raise your hand. Okay. It's no no one was opposed to this one. Okay, this one passes. Thank you. No, thank you. That concludes my report. Back to you, Chair Corman. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other business? Director Olson. I'm not sure if this is uh, too late to say this, but in the minutes from our last meeting, it stated that Bloomington United for Youth was changed to Y for Y, and it's actually the Box City Vigil was changed to Y for Y, Youth for Youth, but Bloomington United for Youth remains um, BUY. So I just wanted to clarify that. Good catch. Yeah, thank you. I read those minutes. <laughs> Good. Great. Okay, so it's time for adjournment. Would somebody like to move adjournment of the meeting? So Motion moved. to adjourn. Oh, that was a lot of people at the same time. Who was that? That Bibi. Director Bibi. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Director Olson. And uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Hi. 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 Anybody opposed to adjourning the meeting? Okay, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone.